Um, so yeah, my name is Kevin Lina. I'm going to be telling you guys about uh, building a grammar for statistical graphics uh, using Clojure. Uh, the agenda for the talk, it's in two parts. Uh, the first part of the talk, I just want to kind of talk broadly about data visualization, um, kind of what's out there. It's a, it's a really exciting field to be in. So kind of what's going on? What do I mean when I say data visualization? And also sort of how you go about doing it. So both in terms of tooling and then also kind of the 101 of human perception and you know, mapping uh, data to visual things. Um, and that's going to lead me to the second part of my talk, which is uh, building a grammar of graphics. So, you know, there's so much out there, you know, how can you think of all of these seemingly very different things, so, you know, bar charts and line charts and all this stuff, how can you kind of put them together in a single framework um, to, to think about them and reason about them? Um, and so I have a 40-minute slot. I'm going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes, um, and then we'll have five or 10 minutes for questions. Um, so yeah, as uh, Stuart said, you guys should all have a handout. Um, it's got my uh, email and, and all this stuff on there. So if you do have additional questions, you know, feel free uh, to ping me on Twitter, send me an email, and we can talk more about this stuff. Cool? Sweet. Um, OK, so part one, data visualization, what, why, and how. Um, rather than try and you know, just tell you about everything that's out there, uh, I'm going to keep it actually very limited and just talk concretely about uh, some of the projects that uh, I've been lucky enough to work on over the past year um, and, and just give you an example. And I'm hoping that when you see those, you can kind of step back from the particulars of it and see maybe some of the uh, motivations and some of the benefits and how those might apply to things that you're working on yourself, so on your own projects. Um, and then after that, I want to talk about, you know, like what and why, right? Um, but then also how. So, um, you know, I'll, there's a lot out there. You know, you can find a lot of stuff on the internet now, uh, blog posts about how to, how to do these things, how to draw them and make them on the computer. But you don't actually see that much about um, how to actually do them in theory or how to do them well. And, and there's a lot of research, very good research that's done about uh, human perception that uh, most people don't know about. So I kind of want to give you guys a crash course on that um, and then also uh, talk briefly about what's out there. Um, so this is uh, the first example of a project that we worked on this past year. Um, this is a, an iPad dashboard that we made for a client uh, who runs wind farms. So this is, this is actually all closure script, by the way, which is uh, really fun, um, harrowing at times, but fun uh, to do. And the, the, the thing that uh, this client had was basically, you know, they, they did, had done all the hard work. Like they have all these wind farms and they had all this infrastructure in place uh, to collect data about it, right? So they were getting, you know, every half second or every second information about all of the different turbines, like the wind speed and how fast the rotors are going and the oil levels and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so they were taking all this data and just putting it in a database. Um, and the problem was, right, it, it doesn't really do anyone any good just to have this stuff in a database. Like, it, it wasn't accessible to the people who were actually in the field. So people on the ground who had to maintain these things, you know, they're not going to just stop and sit down and write like a giant SQL query to answer their question. Uh, and so we did, you know, really what were a lot of very simple visualizations, you know, so this is just a screenshot um, of uh, bullet charts, which are kind of like a, a bar chart. Um, and so, you know, it's just showing very simple scalar values, but to put it on an iPad and actually have it, you know, in the Jeep, in the desert, where you can look down and, and kind of see what's going on is very powerful. So to kind of put, put this information out there where you need it and do it in a visual way where you can just glance down uh, and kind of get a sense of what's going on. Um, this is another example of a project that we worked on. This is actually open source, so it's, it's on the GitHub. It's also a ClojureScript project. Um, this is for, um, this is a collaboration with the Harvard School of Public Health, and this is actually um, a dashboard that they wanted for biologists to look at um, gene sequencing data. So you guys have probably heard all this stuff about uh, genome sequencing and, and, and all this uh, kind of thing. And, you know, you have to remember that most biologists are not like us, right? They're not developers, and it's not natural for them to just get a giant text file of all their, their genes in whatever organism they're studying and then to start banging out like a Perl script or whatever uh, to answer their questions. And so, you know, this is just a very simple kind of like, um, this is all built in the browser. And so it was just like, you could go and upload uh, your file and then start looking around, you know, looking and selecting uh, subsets of these different distributions. Um, but you could answer your own questions, right? And so that's really powerful. Like none of this is uh, crazy advanced computational stuff. You know, it's just sub-selecting on these different things. But to, to put that in a browser and make it accessible um, to practitioners is really powerful because they can kind of help themselves, right? They can answer their own questions. They don't have to wait, you know, two months for a postdoc to come by who knows how to program. 
Um, and, and one thing I want to say about uh, this kind of data visualization stuff, right? So I showed you this bioinformatics example and this, this wind power example. Um, this isn't something that's limited to just very you know, kind of like technical domains, right? Um, there's a, an example that I really love. Um, this is a screenshot from uh, Orbit, so one of these flight search engines. You know, you, you type in, you want to buy a flight somewhere. This is a results page, um, and you can see like just above the fold, there's like two um, results there. And this is kind of typical in, in the stuff that we build, and a lot of times we don't think about this being a, a design process. Um, but it, it's kind of neat, there's a company out there called Hipmunk, and this is their take on the same, the same page. So this is their results page for flight search. So if you search for a query, you know, this is a, um, you know, just showing from Portland to Copenhagen all the different flights that you can get. Um, but they did it in a visual way, and so you can look at it and see what's going on and answer certain kinds of questions um, much more easily than you can um, in just a straight up text thing, right? So in this, you kind of have to scroll up and down and juggle all of these um, times and prices in your head, but on here, you can kind of just look at it and get a sense um, of what's going on. So the actual encoding they're using here, each uh, row on this is a different flight or, you know, uh, I guess a, a trip, they're made up of multiple flights. They're sorted vertically by the price, and then uh, they're positioned horizontally based on the time of departure. So the earliest, you know, the far left is like early in the morning, and then moving over is later in the day. And it's just great because you can, you can just look at this and, and very immediately kind of see and compare in a way that you can't do with something like this. Um, so yeah, we had nothing to do with this, but I just love using it as an example. Um, so, so that's uh, enough of kind of example, and so I want to talk quickly about sort of the how of data visualization and, and sort of the theory. Um, what data visualization really is, uh, you know, fundamentally all of these different things um, is a mapping from some data to vis different visual aesthetics. Um, so you guys are familiar with what data looks like, you know, like a SQL table or, you know, a vector of maps or, or whatever. Um, and when I say visual aesthetics, what I mean are there are a, a number of different dimensions that uh, we can use to, to display quantitative data. So this is just a subset of them. Um, this is on your handout as well. But doing things like saying, okay, we're going to take a quantitative value and map it to the length of a line or the width of a line, you know, the size of an object, the hue or the intensity of a color. Um, these are all different ways that you can encode that information. And, and that's what you are doing when you're making a, a data graphic, right? So a bar chart or a pie chart or whatever. Um, so uh, if you look at something like the, the Hitmonk example here, what they've done is, um, you know, they've used a 2D position to map two different variables, right? They have time moving from left to right and then cost um, going up and down. And a 2D position is a very good aesthetic. It's something that um, we can perceive very easily and understand. So if I ask you, right, uh, what's the cheapest flight? Uh, it's very easy to answer that question visually, right? Because I said, you know, it's ordered vertically by the price. So you can just look at the top and say, okay, that one's the cheapest. You know, and if I say, which one is the flight that leaves the earliest in the morning? You know, it's very easy to see that it's this one kind of down towards the bottom because that's the one that starts furthest to the left. Um, this isn't the only encoding they're using here. Right? You can see um, they've used color to encode the different carriers, um, so different kinds of airlines uh, is the color. They've also used the width of these bars is basically the duration of the flight. Um, but width is not something that is as easy for us to perceive um, as a position in space. So if I say, uh, look at this, what is the shortest flight that you could take? It's very hard to see. You know, it's not something that jumps out in the same way that um, position is something that we can jump out and perceive. So uh, there are sort of two lessons to take away from this. Um, the first one, as I said, is that uh, some aesthetics are better than others visually for, for um, encoding uh, quantitative data. So we're much better at seeing something like 2D position or the length of an object, um, objects aligned on a common baseline. So, so these are you know, sort of the, the workhorses of data graphics, like a scatter plot or a bar chart, you know, they're using these aesthetics because they're very good aesthetics. There's things that we can um, look at and understand very easily. It's very easy to see, you know, if you have um, bars on a common baseline to see that, okay, this one is about, you know, this one is twice as long as another one. Um, so those are kind of the two that, that you should really rely on as much as possible. Um, and both of those are better than something like width. So the width of objects that aren't sharing a common baseline, much harder for us to see. Um, and that itself uh, is much better, though, than using something like size. So you hear uh, data viz people a lot of times ragging on pie charts, and, and that's because pie charts are using the size of an object to encode um, a quantitative value. Um, but it's actually very hard you know, to see you know, how much larger is this circle than this other circle. 
Um, and, and that's something, you know, if, if, if you're skeptical about this or if you really like pie charts, what you can do is just take the labels off and then have people guess, right? Have people actually try and assign numbers to it and they will be so far off, you know, and that's because we're not good um, at seeing that. Um, so, so that's the first thing to take away is that just, you know, know that some aesthetics are better than others and, you know, there's a lot of research in this area, but if you just kind of use the rule of thumb of like, let's use position or let's use length, like you'll be pretty good most of the time. Um, but because some aesthetics are better than others, the other thing that you need to remember is that you should always have a thesis when you're making a data graphic, right? I mean, it's no different than uh, writing an essay or something like that. Like, fundamentally, you're making this data graphic because you want to communicate data to someone else, right? You're trying to make a point, you're trying to make something clear, and so you need to know what that is, you know, so you can choose the appropriate aesthetic, right? So um, going back to the Hipmunk example for their flight search, you know, they say, what are the two most important things when you're buying a flight? Well, most of the time it's going to be, you know, the price of the flight and when it's leaving. And so that's why they map those things to uh, the position because th that's like the best aesthetic that we can use. Um, so that's something just to, to always remember because, you know, people ask me all the time, like, what's the best data visualization? And my answer is always like, what are you trying to do? Like, I don't know, you know, you have to think about this and you have to have a thesis. Um, so, so that's enough of, of uh, the theory. You, know, you guys probably are more interested maybe in the how now for, for the practice. Um, and kind of what's out there now um, on the web and just in programming in general, it kind of falls into um, two different groups that I think of. Uh, the first group of things is, is what I like to think of as kind of the off the rack kind of stuff. So like, like a pile of t-shirts, you know, you walk into a store, you see something that you like, you put it on, you like it, you buy it, you're done, okay? And so this is something like uh, Microsoft Excel, right? You have all these buttons uh, at the top, you have just buttons for a pie chart or a line chart or whatever, and if you see something that you like and it fits your data and it shows what you want to make, you, you make it and then you're done and you're good to go, right? And, and this is what most people are familiar with when you make uh, data graphics is this sort of off the rack kind of cookie cutter stuff. So this is Excel, you know, Adobe Illustrator has a little chart button. Um, here's like the meta slide for my talk because in Keynote, you know, you can make all these things too. Um, so th that's kind of what most people are familiar with. Uh, the other extreme is this sort of uh, bespoke approach, right? So if you know exactly what you want and you have super particular needs, you can go and, and do all the hard work to make it. Um, I really like this picture because so there's this guy wearing this uh, plaid suit, but the, the stripes on the plaid between the breast of the suit and like the sleeve, they like line up at the seam. So he, like, he really wanted that, okay? And he did a lot of work to make that happen. Um, and in the same way, if you have a, a data graphic and you've designed it and you know exactly what you want, you, there's a, some nice stuff out there where you can make it. So there's this great project um, from last year called D3 by this guy, Mike Bostock, uh, out of Stanford, who is now at the New York Times. Um, but the kind of thesis on, on this particular project was like, hey, uh, the web is super awesome, right? Like, there's all this great stuff in modern browsers in terms of vector graphics and CSS and interaction and all this stuff. Um, so this is actually a JavaScript library that you can use to make um, custom data graphics. So it's really neat. Uh, if you go in on their GitHub, you know, they have this, uh, examples and things like that, and they just have tons and tons of really cool uh, stuff, you know, but uh, the problem with bespoke graphics in the same way, like sort of the problem maybe with bespoke clothing um, is that it's a ton of work, right? In the same way, like doing a bespoke graphic is a ton of code. Um, so this is just like something that I made for like the Hipmunk example in Clojure, but you know, you have to have all this code to generate the markup, you have to have all this CSS, you have to do all of this stuff. And so there's kind of these two extremes right now where um, you know, you have this general stuff like D3 or just, you know, using the Canvas or SVG or Java 2D or whatever, basically saying, you know, give me a blank piece of paper and I'm going to draw everything myself. Um, and then the other extreme, which is, hey, here's a big collection of, um, you know, stamps or cookie cutters um, and, you know, you just pick the one that you want and then it stamps out your graphic uh, and that's it. And so uh, there are these two extremes right now and what I'm interested in is, you know, is there something that we could have in the middle, right? Is there something where we could have something that's a little more flexible than, than Excel, um, but is not as much work as just having a crayon in a giant canvas where you have to draw all the axes yourself and draw all the guides and, and do all that kind of stuff. Um, so not surprisingly, this is going to lead me to the second part of my talk, which is a, a grammar of graphics. Um, that, that phrase maybe sounds a, a little silted or, or strange, right? You know, this is, uh, programming, why is it not like a, a DSL for graphics or something like that? Um, and the reason is that the grammar of graphics, it was actually a book um, by this statistician named Leland Wilkinson that came out in 1999. 
Um, so this is kind of a, a very thick um, academic book, but his, his goal, um, he, he says in the book actually, he says, this is the grammar of graphics. There are no others. Um, this is what you would use to describe any kind of statistical graphic. So it's actually very uh, kind of heavyweight and complicated, you know, and, and he uses it um, to describe just everything from, from maps to bar charts to line charts to all of these other things that, you know, we don't even have names for. Um, and so it, it's kind of an interesting work uh, from an academic standpoint, uh, but the way I actually found out about the grammar of graphics was uh, through this other thing. Um, so in 2005, another statistician named Hadley Wickham uh, implemented a simplified version of the grammar of graphics um, as part of his PhD thesis, um, and he implemented it and embedded it in the R programming language. So I think we've heard a couple people mention that already today. Um, but this is where uh, I think a lot of people learned about it, and people actually started using it. So uh, instead of having the cookie cutter graphics, you could actually use the grammar of graphics in R um, to build kind of custom stuff, which was really neat. So I want to just give you a, a quick uh, flavor of, of some of that stuff. Um, and to do that, I'm going to show you some graphs made from this uh, simple data set. So this is a classic data set used in the R community of just cars, right? So each row is a different car, and the, the variables are things like the fuel efficiency and miles per gallon and the horsepower of the engine and the weight of the car and stuff like that. So uh, some of the graphics, this is what uh, they look like actually coming out of R, and this is the actual R code. So you can see um, instead of having some sort of function that's like make me a scatter plot, the function is here's my data, uh, here are the aesthetics I want you to map um, these variables against. So I want to map the weight aesthetic to the x um, dimension and then the miles per gallon uh, variable to the uh, y dimension. And I want to use points to represent that. So that's how you would say, make me a scatter plot. And what's cool about this is that you know, it kind of splits apart these different concerns and, and you can add additional um, aesthetic mappings very easily kind of in this framework. So you can say, oh, what if I want to color these points um, by the number of cylinders in the car? You can, you can do that pretty easily and you know, the system draws you a legend and things like that um, on the side. And of course, you, know, you have other kinds of, of uh, geometry, so doing things like box plots, and it is an R, which is a statistical language, so you can do things like having uh, uh, curve fitting and, and moving averages and things like that. Um, the, the sort of problem with this um, is that unfortunately it is written in R, um, which aside from having this horrifically ugly logo, um, is also, I mean, this is what Edmund said earlier uh, this morning, is it, it's kind of this island, right? You know, R is this academic language, and, and it's great if you can get your data and you go in your corner and you fit your models and you're sort of playing by yourself and then you come back with the answer. But um, so many people now, and, you know, especially in this, this uh, room and in this community, uh, we, we don't sort of have that luxury. Like, we're building systems in production. Like, we have all of our data is not something we can just spit out to CSV and, and then take over in the corner and look at. And so um, I was sort of thinking about this problem, and, and you know, no surprise, it would be really nice if we had this in uh, a nicer language that, that more people could use. And so I've been working on implementing the, this grammar in Clojure, um, but you know, the important thing is not actually that it's in Clojure, that's sort of an incidental detail. The important thing is that um, Clojure is on the JVM, right? So you're going to have this library um, or this service that is accessible by sort of the broader community uh, of developers, right? So you have all these other languages on, on the JVM ecosystem. You have the actual you know, nice toys like Hadoop and, and web servers and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so that's kind of uh, the goal uh, of this thing that I'm working on is to, to take this idea, which is a very interesting idea, um, and then move it over into a, a space where more people can actually use it. Um, but I, I want to step back before I actually start showing you uh, code examples and things like that uh, in the, the closure grammar of graphics. Um, and try and motivate, again, sort of why you would want to do this. And, you know, it's nice. Um, I gave this talk to a non-closure non uh, group and uh, sort of had to explain this stuff. But here, it, it, I think you guys have understand many of the, these ideas. But, you know, fundamentally, the idea here is that um, most of, of the way we make charts and graphs and all this stuff, it's totally complected, right? If you have a function that just says, like, draw me a scatter plot. This is just this insanely complected function because like think about what it's doing. Like think about all the different things you have to do to make a, a statistical graphic. You know, it, you have to do things like um, calculate the extents of all the different scales that you're using. So looking at the data and, and the variables and, and figuring out how much room they need. You know, you're doing linear scales and log scales. You have to calculate all of these tick marks. Um, you know, doing things like curve fitting or other sorts of statistics. Um, and then once you've done all of that, right, you actually have to draw this stuff, right? You have to iterate over the data and, and draw um, all of these labels and guides and this kind of stuff. And um, if you, you just have this function, you know, that's draw me a scatter plot, 
and you want to kind of change these little pieces in here, it's just insanely difficult to do, right? I mean, in, in Rich's talk, when he introduces the word complected, he has this example of the knitted castle, um, which, I, well, I think it's hilarious because I didn't, you know, it's a knitted castle, so that's pretty funny. But it, it really is like a good, uh, a good way of thinking about it because it's like if this is the castle that you want, if this is the graphic that you want, great. If you want something slightly different, like, sorry, it's going to be a ton of work. You're going to have to re-implement all of these things um, because all of this stuff is tied together um, in this, this one function or in this cookie cutter sort of thing. And so the idea, again, with this grammar of graphics is ultimately, you know, you want to decomplect all of this stuff. Uh, you want to take a statistical graphic and you want to break it into the different fundamental pieces. And so if you step back and think about what those pieces are, um, you know, of course you have your data. You have uh, the geometry that you're using in your graphic. Maybe you have more than one kind of geometry. This would be things like points and lines. Uh, if you're making a map, right, you have polygons and areas, uh, box plots, things like that. Um, and then you have your mappings. You have mappings from the dimensions of your data, from your data space into the different aesthetics of your geometry. So these are the aesthetics um, that are on the handout that I mentioned earlier. And then, of course, you have things like statistics and groupings. So if you're making a histogram, you want to bin the data and, and sum it up or maybe do weighted sums, things like that, uh, scales, all that kind of stuff. So, so the idea with the grammar is to take all of these things and, you know, these are orthogonal things and you should treat them as such and, you know, and, and you should be able to work with them um, on this orthogonal level. You want to tease apart all these different concerns. So um, this is actually some, some example specifications and output uh, of what the system does. So um, this is a, a scatter plot, not too surprising, you know, just a closure map. You say, uh, here's my data, here's the geometry that I want, here's the mapping from my data dimensions to my geometry's aesthetics. Um, so you can look at this, this is pretty cool. So this is uh, miles per gallon versus the weight of cars. You know, no surprise here, there's a negative correlation. Uh, heavier cars are less fuel efficient. Um, but you can see there's a little bit of overplotting on some of these points, so they're a little big. Um, so it'd be cool to, to do something to say, okay, let's make the points a, a little smaller. Um, so these are, uh, the system uses tag literals um, for doing this. So point is just, you know, it's, it's like a, it's just a typed um, map, basically. It's a closure record. Um, but it's nice because, you know, this, the, when you want to do these kinds of things, when you want to override the defaults, there's, there's kind of, it makes, there's a natural place to put these things. So just say these things. Like you, you say, I want to make the points smaller, and then you, you change the, this data structure, right? There's not some weird flag that you have to look up, or you don't have to hope that the, the library author has given you some, some option in the make scatterplot function to do this. Um, and the other thing that's cool, right, is you can change all of these things, and it's all orthogonal. So you can look at this and say, okay, you know, that's interesting. Um, what does it look like uh, if we wanted to look at, instead of the weight of cars, you want to look at the cylinders of a car. So that's just a one-line change, right, in this aesthetic mapping. You, want, you don't want to um, assign the weight to the X. You want to assign the, uh, the um, number of cylinders in the engine. So you can do that, and then immediately, you know, some things stand out. You say, oh, it looks like... All of these things are, are now falling into just three distinct groups, right? So all the cars in this data set have either four, six, or eight cylinders. Um, and then once you've done that, you can kind of think, oh, well, you know, now uh, maybe points are no longer the best representation. Like I've kind of discovered this thing about my data, um, but the point geometry no longer makes the most sense. Maybe I want to use something like box plots. And so because all of these things are, are, are split apart, uh, it's very easy to kind of interactively explore and look around, um, which is very powerful. Um, you know, because again, comparing to sort of what's out there now, if, if you wanted to do this, if you wanted to go back and forth from like uh, points on a scatter plot to like a box plot, like you probably have to step back like a page of code because you probably had to munge all of your data to some form of like arrays and arrays so that scatter plot function could eat it. And then if you want to look at box plots, you're probably going to have to step back and like go find the appropriate uh, package or whatever and you know munge the data that way um, to get it in here. But uh, if you can you know split apart all that stuff and just do it in this nice grammar. Um, it, it's very simple to, to sort of explore, which is, which is really important. So um, one, one thing that I do want to point out, um, if, if the astute of you in the audience may, may be noting that um, this seems very sort of suspiciously short, right? Um, because, and, and if you think about it, right, the, the mappings, so the aesthetic mappings, I have uh, X and Y, but that doesn't seem like quite quite enough for a box plot, right? Okay, so X and Y is for a point, that makes sense, but the box plots, uh, they have a lot more aesthetics, right? They don't have a single Y aesthetic, they have the position of the bottom, you know, the position of the middle on top of the box, um, and, and stuff like that. So, so stuff is missing here. 
Um, the actual full specification, um, if you kind of decomplect all these things, that you would need is you need something like this, right? What's really going on here is that um, you, you need to group the data by cylinder. You want to calculate these quantiles uh, for that group, and then you, you actually want to apply um, the results of that calculation. So like the Q25, uh, the, the first quartile, right? Um, you want to do that um, to be the lower part of the box and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so, you know, what's going on here where, you know, you can write this um, to, to get this graphic and, and you know, if, if you show this graphic to someone, they, they would kind of say like, oh yeah, you know, this is sort of colloquially how you, you would say it. Um, but in reality, or kind of to be fully explicit, you'd have to say this. Um, uh, so, so how do you sort of reconcile that? Because if you have to be this explicit all the time, it kind of sucks because then doing sort of exploratory stuff is very hard. Um, so, so really what you want is some, some sort of way to recognize this sort of colloquial or incomplete expression um, and then turn it into sort of the full realized uh, expression that has kind of all the fiddly bits um, spelled out, you know. And, and I was kind of thinking about how, how you'd go about doing this and, uh, you know, looked at how ggplot implemented uh, these kind of um, defaults. Uh, and, you know, really what you want is you want like a nice sort of declarative way to just specify um, kind of rules to say like when you see something like this, you know, and the user has left this stuff out, maybe you should like rewrite it because they probably meant this, that, or the other thing, you know, and, and um, it, it gets really nasty if, if you try and put this in just like just different conditions of the code and stuff like that, right? Like if you, if you want to handle all of these different cases, I would be a huge mess of like if then else statements and stuff. You know, really what you want is some just declarative way to specify these rules and then have the right thing um, automatically happen. So uh, it would be really nice if there was some library in the closure community that could declaratively do rule-based things. Um, and luckily David wrote that library, um, so it, it's called CoreLogic, right? And I was so jazzed about this because I, I found out about CoreLogic at the last conj and um, I, I sort of I had a running joke with um, Paul, actually, Paul DeGrandis, about making t-shirts for the conj this year that said, um, my program would be way better in core logic, and then on the back it would say, if only I knew how. Um, <laughs> and I was so jazzed to find this example of um, not a logic puzzle and not a um, compiler of some kind that uh, I could actually use core logic, but it, it's worked out really great because you, know, you, you do this kind of thing. So here, uh, this is kind of, um, you know, this is a work in progress of syntax, but you say things like, okay, if the specification map, if the person has asked for a box plot and they haven't provided a statistic, they probably want to use quantiles, right? You know, you can just put out all these different rules and, and you can do um, actual uh, unification, right? So you can move things around uh, in these maps um, to turn sort of the, the colloquial stuff into um, what you actually need fully specified. But at the same time, right, uh, if the user knows exactly what they're doing and they want to specify everything out, you know, they can still do that. So, so that's been um, really interesting. You know, same kind of story with something like a histogram. You know, you really, like most people, they want to write something like this. They want to say, yeah, I want bars. I want to use a sum statistic and I just want to look, you know, at this one dimension of the data. But, uh, you know, if you actually want to be pedantic about it, you need to write something out like this, right? You need to say, I want to bin along this caret dimension with this many bins. I want to sum, you know, and, and this is the actual mapping um, from the result of that statistic to the bars. So it, it's really cool to be able to use uh, something like core logic to, to match on this stuff and do rewrites. And so I definitely wanted to thank David for that. And also, um, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Jonas's uh, Kibit library, which, which does this kind of pattern matching um, as a linter for, for closure code, um, which is really where I, I got this idea. So um, that stuff is really cool. And you know, this is possible again, I and mean, this is sort of a theme. So, so Chris mentioned this in, the, in, his, uh, in the first talk. Um, and this is a, a term I heard from, from Alan uh, Dipert, but to data all the things. And this is like so key. And it just, it's like, it, I cannot, I guess, stress this enough. It, stuff becomes so much better when you do that, right? There's no way I would have been able to, uh, you know, do this kind of core logic pattern matching stuff if I had all of my um, stuff tangled up in objects with methods and all the stuff. But because all the specifications just with closure, closure maps and records, you know, you can plug into all this stuff. Um, and, and use um, all this great stuff out there, you know. And, and this, uh, the benefits of using data, uh, I don't want to stress it too much in, in this community because you guys already know it. Um, but, you know, for me it's really nice because, uh, you know, Rich talked about uh, using services and stuff. So making, you know, make our lives a lot easier as a developer, or people who have to develop this stuff to support different languages. So this is the Clojure API and, you know, this is the Ruby API and this is the JavaScript or Python API, right? Like it's all just data. Like, 
you know, it's so great. Um, the other thing that's great about having data is that you can uh, program, right? We're all programmers and, and that's what we do. We manipulate data and if you're just upfront about that, you know, as a library author and you let people um, mess with this stuff, then they can solve their own problems much better than if you try and shoehorn them into using whatever methods that you're providing them and whatever options you're providing them and nothing else. Um, so to give you an example of that here, the actual workflow in the system is you start with this specification, uh, it goes through a kind of compiler and turns into this uh, sort of scene graph kind of thing. Um, and then it actually gets rendered out um, into SVG or PDF or PNG or whatever you want. Um, but what's, what's cool about this uh, scene graph thing is, you know, this is just another huge data structure, right? Like this is just a, a big map, uh, you know, it's got sub maps and vectors and stuff in it. But uh, you can manipulate it with your own code, right? So, so you can say, here's my specification, I want to compile it into this scene graph. Um, and then, you know, you can add your own code into this process. You can, you know, ASOS in and say, I want to update, um, you know, the scale here. So the, the Y axis, I want it to go from zero to 40 instead of uh, whatever extent you've calculated automatically from the data. Or I want to change the label on stuff. Like you can do all this very easily because it, it's just code, right? You know, you just look um, at this thing and it's very evident. If you want to change the stuff around, you can do it. Um, so so that, that's really powerful. Um, and, and, you know, I, I can't, again, say, like, it's been so great to, to sort of this idea of decomplecting things. Like, it's very, very powerful to just look at things and say, you know, what's going on here? And to say, actually, you know, there's a lot going on here. And if you can pull apart those separate pieces, um, you can really get a lot of uh, leverage and a lot of mileage out of that stuff. So um, it's nice because, you know, having this grammar or having this framework um, lets you say a lot of very interesting things, right? You know, you have, if you have a limited vocabulary and you can only say something like a scatter plot or a histogram, you're sort of caught, um, you know, only being able to describe those things. But if you can split apart all of these different concerns um, and kind of have this vocabulary, you can express certain things that maybe you weren't able to express before. And, and you know, really more importantly, it lets you think about stuff um, in a different way, right? So having something like this, when you're actually upfront about thinking about different uh, visual aesthetics, you know, thinking about the role of statistics and all these separate things, um, you can um, put them together in just totally different ways that maybe you weren't even, weren't even able to think about before. And so really, you know, I, I think this is not something that is unique to this particular uh, problem domain. And it, it's, I think, a benefit that you get from, from stepping back and trying to pull things apart um, into smaller pieces. So um, that's all I have. Um, I hope you guys like it. Thanks. Questions? So all this stuff also involves expressing what what some uh, user says in data type. Now one interesting kind of declaration can be like light table or uh, square system for PRC, like how are we going to utilize our own code as developers? So do you have any thoughts on that matter? Like how can we utilize our functions? So, so the question was, um, how can we visualize uh, our functions and our code as developers um, and in light of you know, things like Lighttable and Brett Victor's work and things like that? Um, I don't have any, um, I, I, I don't have any uh, particular thoughts that come to mind on that. Um, you know, this kind of system, too, is right now very focused on um, sort of more standard statistical graphics and things like that. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what that, what that would look like, so uh, maybe talk to me in a year or two. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the question was, have I seen uh, stuff in the R, R library about using um, functions or uh, formulas and stuff like that in the Lattice Graphics package? Um, I, I haven't thought um, about how to sort of expand it even higher level to kind of talk about specific problem domains for stuff. I mean, and this is kind of the thing about using stuff with data. Like, the interface for this is just maps, you know? So, and it's accessible from all the programming languages, basically, because everything has maps. Um, so. Uh, I don't have any sort of plans to move into that kind of stuff, but there is a sort of foundation where you could do that, right? Like you could have a more domain specific thing where you're talking about uh, formula and specific mathematical things and then sort of 
have your programs spit out maps and things like that to, to render. Oh, sure. Yeah, so, so one thing that I, did, that I didn't cover, and I can talk to you more about this a little later, um, but uh, one idea that Hadley Wickham, the author of ggplot, had um, that is implemented in the system is that uh, the plots themselves are a kind of geometry. So uh, it handles faceting and things like that. So faceting is when you take, um, instead of like multiple subplots, so you might want to say, I want to do this miles per gallon versus weight thing, but instead of um, coloring the points by the number of cylinders, I want to actually just make three different plots. So I'll make a plot for uh, four-cylinder engine, six-cylinder engine, eight-cylinder engine. Um, and you can actually do that um, kind of thing because it works recursively. So. Yeah? Sorry, I may have missed it, but can I have code? Uh, so yeah, so the question was, can you have code? Um, yeah, this is not open source right now. Um, actually, it's not totally ready for, for public consumption. Um, it is actually going to be a, a proprietary thing. There will be a, probably some kind of free version, um, but uh, my hand was sort of forced on giving this talk because one of the other speakers canceled and they asked me to come and, and present it. So it's not quite ready yet. Yeah? Have you thought about what you're doing as kind of solving the weekly abstraction problem? Like you're, you're getting high level, but through the DDD like generation, you're getting sort of low level information? Or, uh, or is it still played off the same kind of way? Um, so, uh, yeah, the question was, is there a limit to the customization of this stuff? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, this is never going to be as expressive as having just a crayon and the scene graph, right, or like a blank canvas. You know, the idea is kind of to be in this middle ground where it's going to be expressive and customizable enough for most people's needs. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want to do very custom things or you have a very specific idea of what you want, you probably will still want to use something like, you know, D3 or, or you know, Java 2D or, or whatever. So, yeah. Um, so the question was uh, stuff relating to ClojureScript um, in this. Um, yeah, so actually uh, last year at the Conj, I, I talked briefly about um, some database stuff. And, and so the D3 library is a JavaScript library. Um, I have a, a port that works in Clojure and ClojureScript called C2. Um, you know, and this system, uh, right now it outputs SVG and stuff, and it uh, shouldn't be too hard to port over to ClojureScript. Um, but the actual, you know, a lot of people ask me about interactive graphics and, and things like that. Um, and, and that's a very hard problem. So it's not something that uh, I've, I've been able to think about enough to have a satisfactory answer to. I actually am, tend to be very conservative in like uh, having just well-designed static graphics over you know, kind of crazy customizable interactive things. Uh, but yeah, we can talk more later about ClojureScript stuff if you want. Any other questions? Thanks. <laughs>